Good morning, I'm Christina Tidwell. I'm a registered nurse and holistic health coach. And as a lot of you know, I specialize in working with people with chronic autoimmune issues. Um, so a lot of what comes along with that is finding the right diet for people, improving digestion and all of these things. Um, and so a lot of times we consider healing diets for a period of time. And as I've been working with hundreds of different people, coaching them through various healing diets, I've seen um, a couple ways that healing diets can sort of go wrong um, or sort of some common mistakes people make when embarking on any sort of dietary change. I've been thinking a lot about this recently, so I wanted to share that with you guys if you're at this place where you've either gone through some type of healing diet or thinking about doing it. It's a really important pieces to consider, and I've the title of this is The Dark Side of Healing Diet, so very dramatic sounding, but there is definitely a dark side to it, and there's two pieces, and one of the pieces I'm not going to speak about as much today, um, simply because I want to dedicate a whole amount of time to it, and that's the idea of when you are starting any sort of diet, even if it is a healing diet, how it can change and affect your relationship to food, especially if you have a history of any sort of disordered eating or, um, or a strained relationship to food. So even when we are considering food as a, um, using it as a way to uh, help our bodies heal and feel better, is still putting all of that scrutiny onto our food can be challenging. And there's even a term for it, it's called orthorexia. Um, so it's this kind of fearfulness of um, putting food in your body that's going to harm your body. So this is one side of um, this sort of dark side of healing diets that I is really, really important and important to consider, but not what I'm going to spend the time talking about today, simply because I want to be able to dedicate more time specifically to that. So what I really wanted to talk about today um, is what I see people do all the time with healing diets is have this idea that they are either on the wagon or off the wagon, or they are either good or bad. So I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this before, um, like either doing something like Whole30 or an elimination diet or cutting out gluten and sugar for a period of time, doing the autoimmune protocol, autoimmune paleo. Um, specific carbohydrate. There's all these different types of healing diets that people can do. Um, so I don't know, let me know if you have ever done this, but what I, what I hear people doing or saying a lot around these diets is when I'm on something like Whole30, I feel awesome. I feel like I've reduced a lot of inflammation and bloating. I have more energy. I'm sleeping better. I'm feeling really good. Um, but what what starts to happen when we get away from that really restrictive type of eating or when that 30 days is up and life starts to happen is that people don't really have a plan afterwards for what to do. So you may have like when you're doing a whole 30s had dreams about donuts or wine or cheese or something. And then you go, um, you know, the first thing when you're off of the diet and go just get all those things and indulge in what you were what you're missing and what you were thinking about. Um, and as, as life starts to happen, usually you, you may have learned a lot about yourself through that restrictive phase of eating, but it's ultimately not sustainable. And so what I find people having a really hard time with is this in between, this sort of living in this gray area. And that's what I'm really passionate about helping people with because that gray area is life. It is life, and it's so important to be able to find healthy, sustainable ways to navigate that. And I recently had a client who was telling me that her mom is perpetually just on or off Whole30. That's it. It's either on, really restrictive, feeling good, but restricting a lot of her other life activities, or completely off, not feeling good, talking about how she needs to get back on. So you can see how that yo-yoing is just as detrimental when we're doing healing diets as it is when we're doing something like calorie counting. Um, have any of you guys done Weight Watchers or any sort of like pl diet plan like that where you're sort of restricting calories and you're either, you're either on the wagon or off the wagon kind of thing? 
healing diets can be the same. So that's kind of this dark side of it that, um, that a lot of people don't talk about, which is what I, I want to help people with and what I want to talk about today. So I think, you know, the goal isn't to be, what I want to reiterate here is with any sort of healing diet, like autoimmune paleo or whole 30, the goal isn't to be as restrictive as possible for as long as possible. And it can be tempting to do that once we, if we are very sick and we start to find relief by changing our diet and taking out some of these inflammatory foods that we're making us feel really bad. Um, the goal, however, is to do healing diets for a period of time. They're only designed to be used as a tool. And then the goal is to incorporate as many foods as possible that still make you feel good. So that's the goal, is to not be fully restricted. Um, and I know, you know, if you're doing a healing diet or like Whole30 or AIP or something, it can be challenging. It can affect your social life. Um, and so it's really tough if you're either, you know, you're either on the wagon with no social life, feeling really good, but sitting at home, you know, eating your kale versus feeling really crappy, saying yes to social events, finding joy in that way, but not feeling good in your body. So how do we bring those two together? It is possible, it is so possible. And so I have three tips or three things to think about when we're trying to navigate this gray area. So the first one is the importance of doing a reintroduction process after you have done this healing diet. A lot of people I see will, you know, have done an elimination diet and gain, you know, gain some insight, understand maybe that they do better without gluten or they can only tolerate a little bit of dairy here and there, but they didn't take that next step further to do a reintroduction process of foods to really understand how foods work in your body. So you have that information. So what that looks like is not necessarily going out on day 31 after whole 30 and eating everything that you've been missing for the last month, um, but doing it in a more systematic way so you don't ever have to do it again. And I take people through reintroduction stages. There are certain foods that are better to reintroduce first. And what you do is say it's dairy that you want to reintroduce. Reintroduce um, Parmesan cheese or something. And note how it makes you feel. Do you get stuffed up, a headache, congested, uh, bloated? You know, what's the deal? Or are you totally fine? If you're totally fine, that tells you then you can bring that food in and continue eating that way and you're okay. And you, you have that knowledge so that when you're out in a social setting and you're trying to think, okay, what's going to make me feel good, what's not, you know, oh, I'm okay if I eat that. You have that data. Whereas if you just go and eat everything, then you're not going to really have that data as to what works for you and what doesn't. So it's a, it's a process of gathering information. So if you need more information on how to do that or how to be guided through a reintroduction process to find the diet specifically tailored to you, I can help you with that. So let me know if you have questions, but I really, really encourage you not to um, leave out that piece. That's kind of the most, one of the most important pieces. Um, the second, the second piece, which I've been thinking about a lot lately is defining what this gray area looks like to you. So when we are doing a healing diet and things are very black and white, um, I was going to say it's easy. I mean, it's not easy ever to change your diet, right? It's, it's kind of challenge, but when we know we have a list of what we can eat and what we can't, and we stick to that, that can be easy and comforting to have that rigid structure. Once we are out into an area where we really have to figure this out ourselves, it becomes a little more challenging. And so what I always tell people, depending on what phase of, of this you are at, is to aim for a 90-10 diet, where 90% of the time you're putting in good nutrient-dense food that you know works for your body, and 10% of the time you have that freedom to kind of do whatever you want. Um, but that 90-10 area, we don't really get a lot of guidance as to what that looks like. We only know what it looks like to have strict, rigid guidelines in place or to be in this free-for-all. So what I would encourage you to do and what I've been having some of my clients do lately is just take a minute to write down or think about what, um, 
what that 90-10 looks like for you. So for me, I avoid gluten because I know that that affects my digestion and then sets me up to have autoimmune flare-ups. So for me, that's just something I avoid all the time, and I know that. Um, I know I can have some quality dairy from time to time and be totally cool. I know that about myself. So a 90-10 for me, I'm able to kind of understand what that looks like, but it took a little bit of time to figure it out. So all you have to do is dedicate a five minutes to think about it, write it down. What does 90-10 actually look like for you? What is food freedom and having more flexibility around your life look like? What's important? Is it happy hours with friends? Is it being able to have your wine? What's important to you and what's not as important? What does that look like? And then the third piece here is, is really important as well. And it's about figuring out what are the non-negotiables for you in terms of this 90-10 lifestyle. So what I see happen a lot is when people fall off the wagon or get off of these healing diets after they felt really great, um, it's, it's usually because of times of stress, um, whether that's emotional or physical stress uh, and exhaustion, and they've kind of just not not thought about what um, you know what they were doing before, but it's all kind of started to just break down. And so what I encourage people to do is to have some non-negotiables for you in place that you hold steady or even increase during times of stress. Because what happens is times of stress, you want to eat like comfort sugary foods, you want to drink more of your coffee, increase the caffeine because you're feeling low, Maybe you're feeling sorry for yourself, so you know you're just uh, eating whatever's in front of you, saying yes to everything. But really, that's the opposite of what we want to do because we want to boost ourselves up during times of stress. So think about what are some of your non-negotiables. For me, for example, it's having a good quality breakfast. If I, even if I am the most stressed out, busy person in the world, I make sure that I have a really good quality breakfast. That's what I do. I eat breakfast. I eat breakfast that has protein and carbohydrates and good quality fat in it. That's just what I do. That's my non-negotiable. If I don't have that, I probably would be a horrendous person. So I do that. For you, maybe it's like water. Maybe it's literally just drinking water. That's your non-negotiable. That's what you do for your health. Um, maybe it's batch cooking on Sunday. Maybe that's your non-negotiable. Um, it can be, you know, anything, any of these things. Um, maybe it's having, making sure you have healthy snacks around at work so that when things all start to hit the fan, you know you have something around for you. So take a minute to write down what are your non-negotiables, just what pops up. Let me know in the chat. Tell me what are some of your non-negotiables that you know make you feel way better and that you need during times of stress. Um, so those, you know, those are the main three things that I have been noticing recently that are helping people navigate this gray area. And if you have any more questions about how to do this, let me know. Send me a message, send me a direct message or email me info at christinatidwell.com. Um, and I can help guide you through this process because we don't want to be living in this on and off the wagon kind of world or living in this lifestyle because it's not ultimately sustainable and it doesn't make you feel very good. And so it is possible to have a little more ease and freedom around what we are eating. So let me know what you think about this. And I hope this is helpful just to get a little bit of insight into uh, healing diets and how you can transition after you've done these healing diets. Um, so let me know in the comments what you think. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks.